welcome back. We've looked at how geocentrism fails around the solar system, and how it defies fundamental physics to provide an illusion of a heliocentric one. In this part, we'll bring things closer to home, to see what geocentrism can contribute to the space age. A common question is how geocentrism can explain a geostationary orbit. The special case of geosynchronous orbit where a satellite is situated above the equator and appears motionless. Both have an orbital period of one sidereal day. Geosynchronous orbits, however, need not be circular, whereas geostationary orbits must be. Two orbits with the same semi-major axis will have the same orbital period, so this is what allows for the distinction. We'll use a circular orbit here since we're talking about a geostationary satellite. We saw in part 3 how gravity provides the centripetal force for orbiting bodies, and we can use those same equations to calculate the radius of a geostationary orbit. The mass of the satellite cancels out. As we found in part 3, the mass of the orbiting body is irrelevant to the orbit itself. Multiplying both sides by t squared r squared, we find that r cubed 4 pi squared equals gmt squared. Rearrange and r cubed is gmt squared over 4 pi squared. We know the universal gravitational constant, we know the mass of Earth, and we know the orbital period t in seconds. Plug those in and take the cube root, and we get an orbital radius of 42,166.6 kilometers. The equatorial radius of the Earth is 6,378.1 kilometers. Subtract that and the orbital altitude above the equator comes out as 35,000 788.5 kilometers. This is very close to the altitude at which geostationary satellites orbit. In practice, Earth's gravitational field isn't uniform, because the distribution of its mass isn't uniform, so there are valleys in the gravitational field which satellites tend towards. A signal to and from the satellite will travel over 71,500 kilometers. Divide the distance by the speed of light, and we get a figure of 0.24 seconds. The orbital distance is why communications via such satellites introduce a quarter second delay at the equator, and longer at higher latitudes. Now if the Earth was stationary and not rotating, you could stick a geostationary satellite at any altitude, because it wouldn't need any angular velocity around Earth to maintain an apparent constant position. The benefits to the communication industry for reducing latency on satellite communications is obvious. So why isn't this done? Primarily, it's because geocentrism is bollocks. The geocentrist satellite has another failure up its sleeve. What goes up must come down. Geostationary satellites would crash back to Earth unless they were acted on by a constant thrust to counter gravity. A typical communications satellite may have a mass of up to 6 tonnes, but let's go with 5 tonnes. The force acting on our 5 tonne satellite due to gravity works out as 1,121 newtons. This force needs to be applied constantly to the satellite to keep it in a stable orbit. Satellites have thrusters to allow for orbital adjustments, but not to apply a constant thrust for the entire life of the satellite, which could be up to 15 years. That presents the obvious design challenge of carrying 15 years worth of fuel on a satellite, not to mention the difficulty of lifting 15 years worth of fuel to the required altitude in the first place. We know that satellites don't get launched with whacking great fuel tanks attached, so how long could we expect a realistic satellite to remain up there if Earth were really static? The altitude of a geostationary satellite is more than enough for the force of gravity it experiences to be significantly different from that on Earth. The time taken for an object to fall from a height h to a height r in those circumstances is the arc cosine of the root of r over h plus the root of r over h times 1 minus r over h all over the root of 2 mu times h to the 3 over 2. Mu is the universal gravitational constant times the combined mass of the two bodies, Earth and our 5-ton satellite, the latter being insignificant. 
It's falling from its orbital radius of 42,166.6 km to the equatorial radius of 6,378.1 km. Plug in the numbers, crunch them out, and we find that after less than 4 hours and 8 minutes, our geocentrist is watching his attempt at global communications burning up in Earth's atmosphere. Before picking any wreckage out of the crater where his hoedown barn used to be. Naturally, geocentrists have some excuses lined up to explain why this doesn't happen. The first claim is that a geostationary satellite is moving through space, but because space itself is rotating around Earth, if you match the two speeds, then hey presto, a geostationary satellite. Essentially what is being suggested is a rotating reference frame. We can attach the Sun and other bodies to the grid, and we have ourselves a geocentric universe. Easy, huh? Well, not quite. As usual with geocentrism, a twee explanation that supposedly solves one problem fails to explain the rest of their horse shit. The implication of the rotating space excuse is that an object with no motion against the rotation will move with that space. Consider a rocket launched from Earth out into the solar system. The rocket is steered on a perfectly straight course away from Earth so as to have no motion against the rotation of space. An observer on the ground would see the rocket head westward and circle the Earth once a day. This doesn't happen. If rotating space reaches the surface of Earth, the atmosphere as a whole must be constantly moving appropriate to its latitude, like a geostationary satellite. Unless, of course, geocentrists are claiming that their rotating space for some reason stops rotating above the atmosphere, or that their relativity excuse only applies to satellites and not to gases. Sit in your chair and pretend that a rotating coordinate system is whizzing westwards at up to 1,000 miles an hour depending on your latitude. It doesn't change the fact that you don't have to put any special effort into moving east. It doesn't change the fact that gravity is doing a nice job of keeping you in your seat. And so it is that, rotating space or not, our geocentrist satellite isn't moving relative to Earth and will be crashing back in a little over four hours. The second excuse for geostationary satellites is that gravity drops off to zero close to Earth, meaning that you can just put a satellite up in space and leave it there. As you do. Here we have the same problem of a supposed solution given with zero evidence that doesn't work elsewhere. This explanation would allow geostationary satellites to be placed at any altitude beyond the range where gravity mysteriously stops working. We saw the benefits of being able to do this earlier and we know that it doesn't happen. If gravity has a much shorter range for the Earth, it must do so for all other objects too. This leaves a question as to why periodic comets exist. They go around the Sun, so as soon as one gets out of range of the Sun's gravity, it should just fly off into space. There should therefore be very few periodic comets. Well, Halley's Comet has a period of about 76 years, and at aphelion is 35.1 times further from the Sun than the Earth. Something pulls it back towards the Sun. Now what could that be? No, it's not Mr. Space Hammer Man this time either. GRAVITY, YOU F***ING RETARD! Another effect of gravity not dropping to zero to suit geocentrists is that of Lagrangian points, named after the French mathematician Joseph Louis Lagrange, who discovered the L4 and L5 points mathematically in 1772. They lie 60 degrees ahead and behind a body in its orbit. In 1906, the German astronomer Max Wolf discovered asteroid 588 Achilles in the L4 region of the Sun-Jupiter system. Over 5,600 of these Trojan asteroids have been found so far for Jupiter. Three are known for Mars, and nine for Neptune. In 2010, the WISE telescope confirmed the first Earth Trojan, ahead of Earth orbiting L4, the asteroid 2010 TK7. A Lisaju orbit around Earth's L2 point was home to the WMAP spacecraft. It's the current home of the Herschel and Planck telescopes, and will be home of the Gaia Observatory and the James Webb Space Telescope. The L1 point is the home of SOHO, giving it its uninterrupted view of the Sun. Both the L1 and L2 points for Earth are beyond the orbit of the Moon, 
and are used because they exist and they work, which rather knackers the geocentrist claim that gravity stops working at sufficiently close range to explain geostationary satellites. That's just what happens when your alternative universe and your excuses for it are bollocks. A more typical orbit offers greater possibilities for the geocentrist space program, but let's not break out the moonshine just yet. Let's reinstate real space, the non-rotating kind, and consider the ISS. Its orbit is inclined at 51.6 degrees to the equator. It suffers orbital decay due to drag of about 2 km altitude per month, so the altitude of its orbit needs regular correction. It's consistent enough from one night to the next that we don't need to worry about it here. On the 25th of January 2013, its orbit had an apogee altitude of 420 km and a perigee of 401 km. Its orbit is very nearly circular. Adding these values to Earth's equatorial diameter and halving gives us the semi-major axis for the orbit of 6,788,600 meters. Deriving from Newton's form of Kepler's third law, the period of an orbit in seconds is 2 pi times the square root of the semi-major axis cubed over mu. As before, mu is the standard gravitational parameter, which works out as 3.987 times 10 to the 14. Plug in the numbers and the period of the ISS's orbit works out to be 5,566 seconds, or 92 minutes and 46 seconds. For the geocentrist, observing the ISS should be an easy experience for those along its flight path. Since Earth supposedly doesn't rotate, it should take the same path overhead every time. All the geocentrist needs to do is stand under the orbital path of the ISS and watch it pass overhead every 92 minutes and 46 seconds. Unfortunately for them, this doesn't happen. Divide the orbital period by the length of the sidereal day and we find that the ISS completes its orbit in 0.065 days. In this time, the Earth will have rotated 23.26 degrees underneath it. Sadly for geocentrist observers, the reality is that they will have to wait longer than an hour and a half before the ISS tracks the same path across the sky again. The reason for this, of course, is that the Earth rotates about its axis and geocentrism is bollocks. In part 5, we'll see what happens when geocentrists try to explore space from their fixed homeworld. What could possibly go wrong? See you then.